Hey, what's going on guys? Thomas here. So we are going to move from the recruiting phase to the hiring phase of this process. Remember, we're in the people business. If we can find the right people, we tend to achieve the right results. So we want to really dig in and take our time. I was taught by one of my mentors that you're slow to hire and quick to fire. Slow to hire just meaning we're proactive. We're building a bench. We are not in a rush. We're not in a hurry. We're not desperate, right? Slow to hire. And then quick to fire. Uh, that's something we'll talk about later. But the reality is if you've got someone that's underperforming and they're not raising their level of performance, the very worst thing you can do is keep them around because that tells everybody else in your company that's acceptable, right? So we're going to talk about the hiring process. We're going to go through some of the details of the hiring process. I will tell you that a lot of this comes from my own experience. Uh, especially in the heating and air conditioning world up in Dallas, Fort Worth, hiring salespeople. And so a lot of this detail will come from that experience. Some of it will come from a book that I read a few years ago that was all about recruiting and hiring. So let's dive right in. Step number one, a phone interview. Listen, I want the phone interview to be about 15 minutes max. One of the very best books that I read on recruiting and hiring was titled Who? W-H-O, one word, two authors. And what he talked about was top grading. Listen, this first phone interview, the reality is you've got limited time, limited space, don't waste it, right? So in this phone interview, let's make it 15 minutes and let's top grade this candidate. First and foremost, to find out, do you even like him or her? Because if you can't imagine showing up to work every day with this person, you probably don't need to hire this person. So do you even like them? What's that first impression like? In the book, he talks about asking three questions, and I'm a big proponent of this. I've used it, it works. Three questions that start like this. When I call your previous employer, and that's really important, when I call. What that does is create now a positioning for that person to have to answer a lot more honestly about their results. It doesn't give them as much room to fluff the results because I said, when I call. Here are the three questions, and this will all be in your training binder. When I call your previous employer, what would they tell me was one of your greatest achievements while you were there? When I call your previous employer, what would they tell me was one of your greatest areas in need of improvement? When I call your previous employer on a scale of one to 10, one being not so likely, 10 being very likely, how likely would they be to rehire you? And when you're asking these three questions, and I love what the book said, and this has helped me so much, listen for the consistencies. So I'm going to give you a really quick example. I was doing a phone interview for a Restoration One owner. And one of the things I kept picking up from this salesperson was that she had been passed over for promotion several times. And she mentioned it throughout the process. You know, I put in for the promotion, didn't get it. Uh, went back into sales, later put in for the promotion, didn't get it. And what was interesting, every time that she, she would say didn't get it, she would give the excuses or the reasons why she felt like she had been kind of shafted and didn't get the position. In my brain as a manager and as a leader, what I'm thinking is there's a reason why this person gets keeps getting passed over for this position. So in the interview, I put her under a little bit of pressure. And I said, listen, if you don't mind me asking, how would you respond if I told you I didn't think this call was going really well? And she became combative. She became argumentative. And I saw, which we'll talk about in a second, some of the things that I saw in the profile come out when I challenged her. There was a reason, folks, that she wasn't getting promoted. And I kept hearing it consistently, which raised the opportunity to ask a very pointed question. And I got the response we needed. Here's the bottom line. Just through the phone interview alone, I saved that owner a lot of money and a lot of headache. All right. So the phone interview is about 15 minutes max. Trying to find out, you know, that first impression. Do I like this person? Would I want to work with this person? Three questions. Listening for the consistencies, positive or negative. If that goes well, I'm going to book an in-person interview. I'm going to schedule that in-person interview. In-person interview for me is going to be about 30 minutes max. And I have a couple of rules for in-person interviews. I don't want to be on the opposite side of the table of the candidate. Matter of fact, 
I will typically pull my chair around and sit on the same side of the table, leaning towards them a bit with my, with my positioning of the chair. So it's face to face on the same side of the table. I want to create an environment, a culture where we work together. It's not me over here and you over there. So that's just one of my rules about this in-person interview. You will find I focus a lot on mindset. Like I will ask questions like, tell me about the last time you've been through any formal sales training. What did you learn? From what you learned, what did you implement? And from what you implemented, what kind of results did you see? And I'm gonna dig in there. And I'm gonna probably dig in with some leading and logical questions based on their response. Again, I'm actively listening for the response of, well, you know, hey man, I just went through this training with Service Excellence Training down in Austin. They did a really good job of teaching how to ask better questions, uh, more focused questions to get the answers we want. Man, that really helped me. I implemented asking better questions and I started seeing immediate results. Now I'm hearing some really good things from this person and I can dig in. Tell me more. What specifically were you asking that was different than what you were asking before? And now it becomes very conversational. Now that's real important. I want it to be a conversation, not an interrogation. So questions, listening, and responding. This person should be doing most of the talking and I'm just guiding the conversation with the leading and logical questions. So, I'm listening for consistencies, I'm listening for the positives, I'm listening for driven, competitive, motivated, self-starter, hungry, right? I'm, I'm listening for all of that mindset stuff. Here's why. If they've got the right mindset, I can teach them the right skill sets. How do I know? That was me, right? I was not good at sales for a long time early in my career. Part of it was because I wasn't very coachable and trainable. I was a young, cocky kid, right? So as you get older and you mature, you become coachable, you become trainable. I'm driven. I've always been driven. I've always been motivated. Nobody has to motivate me. I'm proof that you can take someone with the right mindset and teach them the skill sets. And now that I have those skill sets, I can pass them along to you. So in this in-person interview, I'm focused a lot on mindset. 30 minutes max, really digging in, making a conversation, not an interrogation. We're on the same side of the table. And what I'm listening for is at the end of this interview, is this person at least a six or a seven out of 10 to move me to the next step? Now, another little nugget about the phone interview and the in-person interview. I will almost always in the phone interview put the person under some level of pressure. What if I told you I didn't think the call was going well? Why? because I want to see how they'll respond. Or will they just kind of tuck tail and run? If they tuck tail and run with me on the phone, guess what they'll do with your client in the field? Same thing on the in-person interview. I will almost always make them sell me something in the in-person interview. For me, it's typically I'll hold up three markers and tell them to pick one. When they pick the marker, I'll say, okay, go ahead and sell it to me. All I'm looking for is will they try? If they won't even put forth an effort, that's a big red flag. If they try and actually do some things well, I'm getting pretty excited about this person, especially if they're coachable and trainable. So I'm going to put them under some pressure. I'm going to make them sell me something just to get a feel for, do they have those chops? Because if they don't have them here, they're not going to have them in the field either. In-person interview, if that goes well, six to seven out of 10, the candidate, I'm going to run the profile. And here's the thing, guys, and I'll probably do a lesson just on how to use the profile because you can use it here for hiring, but also down the road for leading and managing this person. Why? DIS and C. It tells you what their communication style is so you can speak their language. It can tell you how they make decisions because their DIS and C score tell you how they make decisions, fast or slow. Is it more logical or is it more emotional? Is it based on helping others or helping yourself? So the DIS and C really helps us a lot in the profiling stage. Then we've got the motivational factors. Are they motivated by economic, which is money and competition? Or are they motivated by regulatory and theoretical? Which by the way, hint, 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 a lot of plumbers our S and C profile, regulatory, theoretical, and their motivational factors. That's good to know. Now I know that it's not typically going to be the money motivating that person. 
unless their economic score is above average too, right? So we can figure out how to properly motivate this team member should we bring him or her on board. That's important. That's really important. Too many times we're trying to motivate someone through what motivates us. What matters is what motivates them. Really important. Then we get into the big thing, which is the internal external beliefs. Look, if they don't have the right belief system to be an effective salesperson, they will never be an effective salesperson. It doesn't matter what tools you give them because their mindset's not right. Their belief system's not right. Most people disengage from a role because it's not the right role. The belief system doesn't match the role. The role doesn't match their belief system. That's huge in this profiling section. So we're going to use the profile. The profile will typically have some red flags. That's okay. All that does is lead me to a follow-up interview where I'll dig in. As an example, you'll often see someone that, that will have a score that says had a hard time achieving results, had a hard time achieving their goals. Well, I'll dig in there. Tell me about a time when you struggled to hit your goals. Why did you struggle? What did you do differently to exceed the goal moving forward, right? I'll dig in and ask questions. All I'm trying to do is find out mindset. Are they coachable? Are they... Uh, trainable? Are they driven? Are they motivated? Are they competitive? Do they want to succeed? I want to find that stuff out because if they're not here, they're not going to be out there. And it costs too much to make a bad hire. So I'm going to run the profile and dig into the profile. And I'm going to be here to help you look at some of those profiles. And I've got a cheat sheet for you on those profiles. If that goes well and the follow-up interview goes well, I'm going to check their references. Now I know most people go, oh, come on, man. They can't tell you anything bad. Right. It's what they don't say that matters to me. You know, I had a conversation with my former business partner, Todd, over at Service Excellence Training, and we were talking about, you know, the day that I came in and told him I was coming here, that I was leaving. And he said, man, that was one of the toughest conversations I've had because you did so much to help us get where we are. You know, when I started with them, it was just me and Todd. When I left, there was one, two, three, four, five, six of us. So we were growing and we were growing at a good pace. And so think of it this way. If you called Todd, one of the things I guarantee you Todd would have likely said is, man, it was a really tough day when he left because Thomas did a lot to impact the future uh, of this business. It's, we're still reaping the rewards of the work that Thomas put in. It's what they don't say that matters when you check references. Because if they loved the person, they'll probably say, oh man, yeah, he was phenomenal. It was so great having him here. It was so hard to see him leave. Little things like that. They can say those things. They just can't bash the candidates. So I'm listening for what they don't say in the reference check. And you know what? If all of that clears, I'm making an offer if that person's still a good solid seven out of 10, right? Here's the bottom line though. I'm taking all of this information to make a very good decision, a very balanced decision, a proactive decision, right? I'm building a bench more than likely in this process. So the bottom line is this. Every place you sacrifice here, there's going to be a sacrifice on the back end. Maybe it's not the right person. They come in, they do okay for a month, and then they, boom, results crash. Attitude crashes not coachable and trainable, low self-esteem, right? All of that stuff starts happening. Well, it's too late now. You've already hired him. What's it cost to make a bad hire, right? It costs money and it costs reputation. What's the value of a good hire? Could be worth a half million dollars, 750,000, plumbing specialist, a million dollars plus. A CSP, so important to the business, nothing good happens until a call is booked could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to you. Follow a process. You can only do this when you're not operating from a place of desperation. If you're operating from a place of desperation, you hire the first person that walks through the door with some experience. Just curious, how has that worked out for us in the past? How many people have you already churned and burned? Have a process for recruiting, and hiring the right person. Then we'll talk about training, leading, managing, developing, holding accountable, etc. But it all starts right here. 
Hope this lesson uh, provided you some great nuggets, some details. If we want to talk more one-on-one, -on -one, we can. Have a great day, great rest of your week, and have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.